Good morning everyone and thank you for inviting me to your event. My name is Svetoslav but uh, I know how strange it sounds to you so you could use my nickname which is uh, Tsetso. Uh, I'm one of the participants in 2013 Borla Fellowship Program and today I'll be talking about uh, my work in the US, Texas A&M, uh, which was the development of recombinant vaccine for African swine fever. Um, I would like to give you a short uh, background of myself. So, I'm a vet, I graduated in 2008 and then I started my uh, PhD. So, in 2012 I defended it, so now I'm, I have a PhD in uh, genetics. And then I become, became a, an assistant professor at Truckee University in the Department of Animal Genetics. And after that I decided that uh, I would like to go further, so I started a second master's degree in molecular biotechnology and since this April uh, I have this master's degree in uh, molecular biotechnology. In addition to that um, I was very lucky uh, to participate in some programs all around the globe so in 2006 I was lucky enough to participate in the summer school program at Iowa State University. This was my first uh, time uh, going uh, in the US and my first time working with uh, genetic material. I was working with E. coli causing a post swinging dairy in pigs. Next year in 2007 um, I won another scholarship for the University of Cambridge in England and I was working with gene mutants of Salmonella uh, and the possibilities uh, for uh, for those mutants uh, to be used as a life attenuated vaccine. Uh, when I started my PhD uh, I went to the Borstel Institute in Germany and I was working on a recombinant vaccine for ticks. It was not that successful but um, this scholarship helped me realize that I really want to work in the field of biotechnology and this was the primary reason I started my, my second master's degree. And in 2013 uh, I was lucky to be one of the two participants from Bulgaria uh, in the Borla Fellowship program. So I was working at Texas A&M um, on the development of recombinant vaccine for African swine fever. Uh, medicine, by definition, is the science of diagnosis, treatment and prevention. And when you say a word doctor uh, to regular people, uh, the first thing that comes to their mind is uh, someone wearing a white suit and taking care of a sick animal or, or human. And for me, the real doctors are the ones who do prevention. So for me, from my perspective, diagnosis and treatment are secondary and top priority for doctors is the prevention of a disease. Preventive medicine uh, focuses on the health of individuals, communities and population and its goal is to protect and maintain health and basically prevent disease, disability or death. We have uh, four primary methods of prevention and these are disease screening, identifying risk factors, genetic testing and of course immunizations. And on the other hand we have three different levels of prevention. I would like to talk more about the first two. So primary prevention includes methods to avoid occurrence of disease either through eliminating disease agents which is almost impossible. Y you cannot kill all bacteria or viruses. And on the other hand, the other choice is increasing resistance. To increase the resistance of population, you have basically two options. One of them, I was uh, working on it uh, during my PhD. So this strategy is to find genetically resistant animals to infectious agents. So I was working with a disease called Scrapey, which is um, basically the same thing as mad cow, but Scrapey is in, in sheep. So the infectious agent is prion and we don't have any vaccines or any sort of drugs that, that could be used. 
So what I was doing was to find genetically resistant individuals and cross them together. So this, this is the only way to uh, conceive um, resistance population after that. This strategy is known to be very successful, but it's quite hard to do it. Plus, there are no more, not so many diseases that could be um, per, that this strategy would work. So, 95% of the time, our best shot would be immunization. So, basically, vaccines are able to protect animals. Uh, no matter of their uh, genetics. So immunization for humans and for animals is probably the best the best strategy that we could have. Secondary prevention level includes methods to detect and address existing disease prior its appearance. And I would like to give you an example with uh, Ebola. So Ebola is not something new. We all have known it for years. Problem is that while the disease was not spread that much, it was not that huge threat, the medical society didn't pay attention. And today, when the disease is knocking on our front door, we have no vaccine or any sort of drug that could help us. So, I think that we should think about possible future attacks, future outbreaks and address them much earlier so we could be prepared for them once they come. How vaccines work? Well, infectious agents, usually bacteria or viruses, if they want to harm us, um, they need to pass basically the outer layers of our body, so skin, or mucous membranes, etc. Once they do this, there is a secondary mechanism to protect us, and it's called immune system. Important part of this immune system is something called main histocompatibility complex. These are basically memory cells, and those cells can recognize our genetic code. They memorize it and can differentiate anything else from our genetic material. So in case uh, we have a bacteria or virus or whatsoever different from our genetic code, this main histocompatibility cells will detect it and make the whole immune system attack this invader. So this is how the immune system works. How vaccines protect us? Well, usually vaccines are produced by small particles from viruses or bacteria or dead bacteria or dead viruses, etc. So once you apply them into the body, the immune system uh, detects those barely viable viruses or bacteria and uh, attacks them. And since they are not that aggressive, Immune system kills them within 10 to 14 days. But what's more important about this process is that immune system creates something called antibodies. So, in case of a, near, of a real infection, the organism will have enough antibodies to kill the real wild type virus or bacteria. We'll be able to kill it with those antibodies within minutes. So, the whole strategy of using vaccines is to, pr to have enough antibodies for future attacks. Classical and recombinant vaccines. Well, classical vaccines have been around for years. And I'm going to give you an example with the rabies vaccine. We all know rabies is one of the worst infections in the world. And... Um, the way the vaccine is produced is a little bit strange. So, the virus usually attacks carnivores. Could be cats, dogs, wolves, etc. So, the way the vaccine is produced, they take the virus from the carnivore and apply it into rabbit. So, 
The virus is not that aggressive to the rabbit immune system. So what happens there is the rabbit survives and the virus is trying to accommodate, to adapt to the new immune system. So you wait, let's say, 20 to 30 days, take the virus out and apply it into a completely different species, could be goat or a horse. So the virus again goes to a completely new environment. The immune system of horse reacts totally different way compared to the rabbit and the carnivores. So again the virus tries to adapt to the new environment. And you wait for another 20 to 30 days, take the virus out, and this is your vaccine. So you apply this virus to a carnivore and what happens there, even though the virus is 100% genetically identical to the real one, this virus is no longer that aggressive to the carnivore immune system. So the immune system could kill it and establish a high antibody response. So this is how the classical vaccines are produced. On the other hand, recombinant vaccines are produced by taking one, two or even 20 genes from a pathogen and put those genes into a bacteria, usually E. coli. We use E. coli as a biofactory for production of recombinant protein encoded by the genes coming from the real virus or bacteria. This way we receive a recombinant protein 100% identical to the protein obtained from the real virus. So when you apply it into an animal, the immune system could detect it and establish antibodies, even though it have never met the real virus. Positive things, well, for both type of vaccines, we have antibodies, and this is our target, to obtain enough antibodies to protect the body. Bad things, well, I'm going to give you an example with the classical swine fever vaccine. Classical swine fever is pretty bad disease spread all around the globe, and it could be devastating. Well. The way the vaccine was produced uh, was almost identical to the uh, type of vaccine that I told you about, um, the rabies vaccine. So what happens there, the vaccine strain is 100% identical to the real wild type of virus. So in case of an outbreak, you check for antibodies and you cannot tell whether this animal was vaccinated or infected with the wild type virus and this is a huge problem because you cannot differ differentiate infections from a from an outbreak so for these problems um, this vaccine is already forbidden almost everywhere on the other hand recombinant vaccines so you have few genes coming from the real virus but in addition to that we usually add one or two sequences, could be something imaginary, just write down genetic code, whatever, usually five to ten amino acid sequences. And you apply those sequences together with the, with the rest of the genes coming from the real virus. So, the organism of the vaccinated animal will establish antibodies against these small sequences. So, in case of an outbreak, you could easily differentiate the real virus from the vaccine strain because the vaccinated animals will have antibodies against those artificially inserted DNA sequences. Why African swine fever? Well, African swine fever is uh, probably one of the worst infections I have ever seen in my life. It's caused by a virus which is uh, so big that uh, from genetical point of view it carries so many genes that, that it's much closer to humans than to viruses. It's really a big one. And 
from a veterinary perspective uh, and economical perspective, it could be devastating. Severe cases could lead up to 100% mortality rate. In moderate cases, mortality rate is still pretty high, it's 30 to 70%. And usually, some animals survive, they go to chronic stage, but these animals show loss of weight, intermittent fever, respiratory signs, so you basically cannot use those animals anymore. And having in mind how important is the pork industry of Bulgaria, and in whole Europe actually, uh, this could be devastating for the industry. Uh, disease is originally found in uh, Kenya in 1921, and after that uh, it was found and it's still found everywhere in the, the whole continent of Africa. It came to Europe in 1960s in Portugal, and um, then it went to France, Belgium, Spain in 1980s. In 2007 there was a huge outbreak in Georgia and, and it spread easily to Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran, Russia, Belarus. Uh, two years ago it went to Ukraine and we all know what is the situation there so uh, I'm pretty sure that nobody takes uh, pays attention about this, uh, uh, about this disease there. In 2013 uh, it went to Belarus, uh, January this year it went to Poland, very close to the German border, and in uh, just a few months ago it went to Latvia. So you could see from this historical um, explanation that uh, somehow the virus is going and spreading pretty easily all around the globe and uh, someday uh, I'm definitely it's gonna come here and it could be devastating for our industry. Uh, according to the World Organization for Animal Health there is no vaccine and there is no published treatment for African swine fever. So all measurements are rapid slaughtering of animals and basically disposable of everything that was close to them. So it's the game Again, the same picture with, with the Ebola, we have no clue what to do when this happens. Um, since I'm going to work with uh, recombinant vaccine, my boss told me, what is your best gene? What is the gene that you would like to work on? And when we talk about recombinant vaccines, the gene that you choose is, uh, uh, is one of the most important things, because you should find a gene that is crucial for the virus and is present to all strains. African swine fever has eight strains. So if you pick a gene that is found in only one or two of the strains, you could end up with pretty successful vaccine working 100% for those two strains. But in case of an outbreak from the other strains, it will not be working. So I decided to work with this one, it's present in all eight strains, the gene is called B438L, I know it sounds strange, but it's really important for the virus. It plays a role of integral protein, integral membrane protein, which basically helps the virus get inside the cell, so it's crucial for the infectious process. And on the other hand, if you delete this gene, instead of the normal icosahedral structure of the virus, it goes to these tubular structures right here, so uh, the virus is no longer able to infect. So I decided to work with, with this gene, uh, having in mind all these properties. And I told you that in addition to that, we usually add one or two sequences that will be able to give us uh, clue whether it was a vaccine or a wild type virus. So I use this one HA and FLACTAC amino acid sequences. As you see, these are pretty small, it's our 20, 20 uh, nucleotides DNA sequences. So, yeah. And another thing that I did was well, US is considered free from the disease, so we were not able to pick the gene right out from the virus. 
So uh, we check the genetic code and we order it for uh, chemical synthesis. So it's 100% identical to the real virus. So uh, we were not working against the law. So we use three different strategies for uh, DNA cloning. The first one uh, is called PCDNA 3.3 Topo TA. So this strategy gives us the opportunity to take the gene from the virus and put it into E. coli. Then the E. coli start produce, producing recombinant protein 100% identical to the protein coming from the real virus. Having in mind that E. coli are bacteria, they are not able to produce so, so high amounts of recombinant protein, but we had enough recombinant protein to test it in vitro. The second strategy is much more complicated. It's called back-to-back -back HBM topo. Um, basically, this strategy, what you do there is take the gene out from the virus and put it into baculovirus. Baculoviruses attack, attack uh, honeybees. And what we all know about honeybees is that <clears throat> honeybees are capable of producing high amounts of product. So, you put the gene of interest into the baculovirus and the baculovirus infects honeybee cells. As, as a result of this whole strategy, you could obtain a lot of recombinant protein and I'm talking gallons of recombinant protein here. So, you could use this recombinant protein to boost animals and wait for antibody responses. And the third strategy, probably the most complicated one, and it's really cutting-edge technology, it's called VeraPower Adenoviral Expression System. So what you basically do here is take the gene of interest and put it into a human adenovirus. What's important about this adenovirus is that it's 100% safe. We all have met this adenovirus a few minutes after we've been born. So our immune system knows it pretty well and kills it almost immediately. On the other hand, this adenovirus is genetically modified. It could not replicate in a living organism. It lacks some specific genes for replication. So, what we do here is take the gene of interest, put it into the adenovirus and basically inject it into pigs. So what happens there, the virus will die within 10 days because it could not replicate. But it will deliver the gene of interest to the immune system. And the immune system will establish antibodies against the African swine fever virus, even though the immune system have never met the real thing. I know that uh, I usually explain things uh, pretty easily. Uh, but you could see the whole strategy here is quite complicated. If you want me, I could explain it line by line. I could uh, walk you through the whole protocol, but uh, I think it's going to be boring for you. Uh, so um, I would like to uh, continue. If you, if you want me, I could explain everything uh, little by little. So, yeah. What ABF support means to my career? Well, um, I'd like to say one big thank you for giving me the chance to realize my dreams. I was lucky enough to work in, in this building. It's called Veterinary Research, Research Building. And uh, uh, what's important about this building is that 99% uh, of the students of the vet school have never seen it. It's a uh, top security building. It's actually biosecurity level four, which is uh, the highest level. And to get inside there, you need special keys and you have to wear a special suit with uh, a tube that gives you oxygen from outside, etc. So uh, I felt like an astronaut uh, working there. It was pretty amazing adventure for me. And on the other hand, uh, this fellowship gave me the chance to meet probably one of the best mentors in my life, uh, Dr. Mwangi. He's so passionate about um, uh, research and uh, f 
finding diseases that could attack us in the next few years so we should prepare for them uh, even though I had the knowledge I didn't have the experience working with these things so uh, this person helped me a lot and he's still helping me a lot and actually we were both pretty happy with our collaboration there and now we're looking for uh, any possible support for me to go back in the US and continue working on, on this project because truth be told I cannot work with this type of technology here first of all it's against the law the European Union doesn't give you the chance to work with GMOs and uh, I'm pretty sure that five years from now or ten years from now European Union will open the gate for GMOs but since this is forbidden here nobody is working with it and somehow if they open the gate and say okay you could work with GMOs we are at least 20 years behind the US US is pushing really hard this type of technologies in plants and in this case for vaccines but here nobody is working with them so we have no idea how to do it and the other problem that I have here I don't have a mentor I have the knowledge but I don't have the experience so in case I need to know something how to do it specifically there is no one that I could ask so uh, we're basically desperately looking for for new support for me to go there and continue working so uh, let's say five years from now uh, I could start a project here in Bulgaria on a disease that it's uh, relevant to our industry I already have a, uh, have a disease in mind so yeah uh, thank you very much for for giving me the chance to realize uh, how can I leave a huge footprint in my career uh, these are some pictures from the lab uh, unfortunately I, uh, I, I don't have pictures from the biosecurity security level 4 but you're not allowed to bring camera there <laughs> and um, here are some pictures from the final ceremony and I was happy to meet so many people from all around the globe and uh, I participated at the World Food Prize so it was quite uh, quite an adventure for me to participate in the Borough Fellowship 2013. I would like to say one big thank you to America for Bulgaria Foundation for giving me the chance to dream about the best possible things that I would like to work with and uh, supporting me uh, to realize my, my dreams. Of course USDA and the US Embassy in Sofia for for making my visa process so easy to me and of course I would like to say thank you to, to my supervisor actually we speak uh, over the phone every other day trying to find new opportunities to work together and uh, he says hello to you especially to to Mr. Lindaft uh, you've met in person and uh, yeah thank you very much for, for your for your attention guys I really appreciate it.